The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the American Brain Tumor Association's free educational webinar series. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. Today's webinar is on immunotherapy for brain tumors. The webinar will be presented by Dr. Michael Lim. Please note that all lines during our webinar today are muted. If you have a question you would like to ask, type and submit it using the question box in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Dr. Lim will answer questions at the end of his presentation. In the next few days, you will receive an email asking you to take a brief survey to evaluate this webinar. Please take a few minutes to share your feedback, which is important to us as we plan for future webinars. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will post to the ABTA's website on the Anytime Learning page shortly. Registered participants will receive the webinar recording link in a follow-up email message once it is available. Let's pause for a moment so we can begin our webinar recording here. The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss immunotherapy for brain tumors. My name is Christine Daly, Program Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Michael Lim. Dr. Lim is the director of the Brain Tumor Immunotherapy Program at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Lim's primary research interest is developing immune-based therapies against brain tumors. His research laboratory is focused on understanding the mechanisms of immune evasion by primary brain tumors. Findings from his laboratory are directed towards translation to novel therapies against brain tumors. In addition to running the laboratory, he also directs the Immunotherapy Clinical Trials Program at Johns Hopkins. He currently serves as the principal investigator of several large brain tumor immunotherapy clinical trials based on findings from his laboratory. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Lim. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Christine. Um, so uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's really um, a privilege and honor for me to be here uh, today to, to talk to you about I think a very um, exciting avenue of therapy for patients with um, not just brain tumors, but um, cancers in general. Um, so the title of my talk is really Immunotherapy for Brain Tumors, and I'll, I'll be focusing particularly on gliomas and glioblastomas uh, for this talk. So as Christine um, introduced, uh, as Christine made a very nice introduction, it's, um, I'm, I am one of the neurosurgeons here at Johns Hopkins, and um, uh, I have a particular interest in immunotherapy for patients with uh, uh, glioblastomas. So these are my relevant disclosures um, prior to the talk. So as I mentioned before, I think that, or I believe that we are in a, a revolution uh, in terms of uh, cancer care. Um, these are uh, the immunotherapies that are being uh, generated today or the immunotherapies that patients are getting today are working. And uh, as a result, they have been uh, presented in very high profile journals and in the lay press um, because I think for, um, because with the advent of these immunotherapies, we are now seeing patients who are getting cures um, from cancer. Um, in terms of the wish list for what we want for our patients with brain tumors, you know, we hope that someday, in terms of uh, patients getting vaccinations, in addition to getting their regular vaccines, you know, it would be our hope that someday patients could get a brain tumor vaccine uh, as part of the regular checkup to hopefully even prevent these uh, tumors from happening. As I mentioned before, uh, this is a list that I stopped updating in 2016 because um, the um, FDA approvals are just accelerating for these tumors. I, I just saw today that um, PD-1 was approved for cervical cancer, uh, for example. So, you know, uh, there are many different cancers that are responding to these immunotherapies. And uh, uh, it, again, these are some very exciting times. 
Now, what's interesting is that immunotherapy for cancer is is really an, an old idea, and um, it came from. Uh, I mean, it's been used probably historically uh, earlier than with Dr. Coley, but Dr. Coley's and Dr. Coley's toxin. Um, it was really one of the first uh, cases where um, they actually saw patients uh, get cured from their cancer. And Dr. Um, Coley uh, started using this for our sarcomas and um, started giving patients um, serratia marsenskins, or um, with the type of bacteria. And um, the, when he gave uh, patients with cancer these types of bacteria, he was uh, observing cures. And this was a slide that was very graciously uh, provided to me by Dr. Oren Block. So in terms of uh, malignant gliomas, uh, I think uh, for those of you who are, are newer into uh, this world of brain tumors, it is probably the most common uh, type of brain tumor uh, that we see in patients throughout the world. But it's still pretty rare. There's only f about 14,000 cases that are diagnosed uh, per year. But of that, the majority of the patients have a glioblastoma. And we've made a lot of um, advances with, um, in learning about these tumors, particularly in the molecular pathways. And currently, the standard of care for patients with uh, a brain tumor is surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. But even with surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, these tumors are incredibly aggressive. And in many, in many patients, these tumors recur. So, you know, in the past 30 years, there's probably only been a handful of uh, drugs that were approved uh, by the FDA for patients with glioblastoma. And uh, if you contrast that to uh, slide, the slide that I gave about five, five slides ago, where um, we're seeing just, um, just a, a tremendous number of FDA approvals for other uh, types of cancers with checkpoint inhibitors, you know, we are looking uh, and we badly need new therapies for patients with brain tumors, which is why we're talking a little bit about immunotherapy today. So if we think about the immune system, it's probably the, the ideal, um, ideal system to uh, help us attack cancer cells and make sure that the cancers stay in check or eradicate them. Because at its most basic level, the immune system is really designed to recognize and eliminate eliminate foreign antigens from the body. But there is evidence to suggest that it plays an important role in eliminating cancer cells. And we know that by studying patients who've developed severe immunodeficiency syndromes, such as AIDS. And in those patients, they, we see a rise in patient, a number of patients who develop uh, cancers such as sarcomas and, um, and lymphomas. So, if we talk a little bit about immunology, it's, it's very hard to go over the entire immune system in, in an hour, but um, I thought that we could just talk about a couple basic parts of the immune system that will serve as the foundation for the rest of the talk today. So as, as I mentioned before, if the immune system is designed to recognize and eliminate foreign antigens as well as cancers from the body, um, we have to understand that in our body we have um, two types of immune responses. Um, one is called an innate, innate immune response, and another is called an adaptive in, immune response. And the innate immune response is something that um, what I, I call it a pre-programmed immune response in our body. For example, if we get a, a, a bacterial infection in our body, um, the, the virus, I mean, the body responds very quickly and uh, vigorously to eradicate a bacterial infection. And in fact, bacteria have um, pretty classic um, patterns uh, on their proteins that, the, that our bodies recognize. For example, something called lipopolysaccharide is, is expressed on bacterial capsules. And if you were to inject lipopolysaccharide into a, a, a patient or an animal, you could get fevers, chills, and rigors almost immediately. Now, most of these cells um, that do or help us maintain our innate immune response are macrophages and the microglias um, and the eosinophils. And most of the times they do their activity by um, killing the cells through phagocytosis or essentially eating them. 
the adaptive immune response is something that allows us to um, basically evolve with the world as the pathogens evolve. As we all know, viruses uh, adapt and change, and so do um, bacteria. And so this uh, immune response is meant to complement the innate immune response because um, we aren't born with all the pre-programmed um, uh, antibodies to, to recognize every possible um, foreign antigen or foreign infection. So what happens with an innate, an adaptive, again, an adaptive immune response is that you have th these cells um, here represented in yellow, and they, they're called antigen-presenting cells, and they're usually cells such as macrophages or dendritic cells. And I think it's important to remember that I just told you dendritic cells because we'll talk about dendritic cell vaccines in a minute. But these cells basically go throughout our body and survey um, its surrounding. And if it picks up or identifies something that's foreign, um, for example, uh, the, the purple uh, little circles on the top left of this uh, figure, it can actually take them into the cell. They call it endocytosis. And then it processes them, and then it actually um, puts them back onto the surface of its cell to what they call present. And what it does by presenting is it, it shows um, the abnormal, um, I mean, uh, proteins from this abnormal uh, pa foreign, path uh, foreign pathogen to um, your T cells, which are your lymphocytes. And these lymphocytes can then learn what this foreign pathogen looks like and then go ahead and kill it, either through what they call a cytotoxic response, which is the CD8 T cells which they directly try to kill them, or it's through CD4s, which is a helper response, which oftentimes um, uses antibodies. But the most important concept to understand is that this dendritic cell or macrophage or these antigen-presenting cells are really kind of the key, um, key cells in, in initiating this immune response. And oftentimes, this is how we um, become vaccinated against um, certain things like the smallpox. They, you're able to, um, these dendritic cells pick up these smallpox uh, peptides and present them to teach the immune system how to attack, um, uh, for example, smallpox virus. The adaptive immune response as a result is highly specific and um, as a result uh, allows us to evolve uh, with the world. And the nice thing is that you can develop memory uh, so that if you were to get a, a future infection from the the same um, pathogen, you could the immune system could recognize it and kill it. So, one other note that I want to talk about before we start talking about the immunotherapies is this concept of um, this immunoprivileged environment. Some people have said that the brain is a terrible place. Um, um, a terrible place to do immunotherapy because the brain is sequestered away in the body. It has this thing called the blood-brain barrier where very few things um, can traverse back and forth like drugs. Um, and many people believe there was an absence of something called lymphatics. There were even experiments decades ago where uh, people, uh, where Dr. Medawar had actually taken cells from, a, a, from one animal that was a different species and implanted them into the brain of another animal and uh, observed no rejection. I, the analogy I say is it's like a, it's a concept of an organ transplant, but it's just cells. And um, uh, because there was no rejection, he concluded that the brain was immunoprivileged. However, we know today that the, the brain and the uh, spinal cord uh, can actually generate a very vigorous immune response. And we've seen people with autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. We actually see in patients with cancers in the brain, like glioblastoma, that there are lymphocytes, you know, T cells that infiltrate into the tumor. And um, there was actually a follow-up experiment to Dr. Medawar where they could show that you could actually vaccinate these an those animals that received the foreign cells. And um, if you vaccinated those animals to those foreign cells, then the animals got rid of those cells. So um, 
many of us now believe that you can still generate a very effective uh, immune response. So now that we talked a little bit about the basics of uh, the immune system, how do we harness the immune system to fight cancer? Okay. And right now, immunotherapy is kind of broken into three basic concepts. They call it cytokine therapy, passive therapy, and active therapy. And I'm going to focus today on active therapy. But cytokine therapy, just to, go, um, just to talk about it for a second, is this concept where there are proteins that are secreted by our immune system to turn cells on or turn cells off. That, that basically, um, they call them, for example, interleukins. And people have found that when you give interleukins to immune cells, sometimes you can turn them on. And so people have been trying to use some of these uh, proteins to try to turn on the immune system. Passive therapy is where people have developed antibodies that might be specific against cancers to try to turn on the immune system. And that's another avenue that a lot of people are looking at. Um, lastly, the active therapy is really kind of the, the based on this idea of the vaccine, and that's what I uh, spend the majority of uh, the rest of this talk on, uh, focusing on vaccinations, and then talk about some of the other novel immunotherapy approaches that don't necessarily fit into these categories. So with the vaccine, um, um, again, the, the concept of this is to try to teach the immune cells to identify cancer cells. And so if you remember back to that slide where I had the yellow cells and the, um, the red cells, which were the T cells, um, we're basically trying to utilize that adaptive immune response to um, essentially vaccinate the patients against their own cancers. So many people are focusing either on the, the T cells or the macrophages and microglia or the dendritic cells, which are the yellow cells, to try to get an immune response. Now, in terms of the vaccine trials, there are many vaccine trials that are on, under that are uh, ongoing um, uh, in, in, in glioblastoma or have just completed. I think the three most prominent trials are what's called the CDX110, um, which is also known as the EGFRV3 vaccine. Um, there are some dendritic cell vaccines, and then there's something called the heat shock protein or the oncophage. Now, in terms of the CDX110, um, this is the, a concept where um, we're, again, trying to teach um, the immune system to recognize um, a foreign antigen. And this antigen, I mean, an antigen that's expressed on the tumor cells. And this antigen is called epidermal growth factor receptor, receptor 3. It's called EGFRV3, which is represented here in these black triangles. And it turns out that this protein is uniquely expressed on cancer cells, but not on human cells. And it turns out that if you inject um, this protein, much like a vaccine, into a patient, your uh, immune cells will come in and pick up that peptide. The, essentially, they would be those yellow cells from the slides that I showed earlier. Those are the antigen-presenting cells. Those antigen-presenting cells then learn what that um, epidermal growth factor B3 or EGFR B3 peptide looks like and teaches it to the T cells. And then what happens is those T cells, in theory, traffic into the brain to then uh, kill the tumor cells, okay? And so there was very promising data from uh, phase one, phase two, um, phase one and phase two trials showing that there might be some increased, I mean, there was some improved survival in these patients. And what was interesting was that in patients who received this vaccine, and what was interesting was that, that um, they had found that in the patients whose tumors recurred, the tumors came back negative for this um, EGFRV3. In other words, the tumors that came back did not express this EGFRV3. So many people believed that there was an immune response. And that uh, led to a very large international trial, um, a phase three trial, where patients were randomized to either receive the vaccine or not. And the results of the trial were just published last year. And unfortunately, the trial was negative. And um, uh, even though the phase two trial suggested that it was positive. And so um, uh, at this point in time, that this dendritic cell vaccine, this EGFRV3 peptide um, vaccine uh, doesn't look like it's working. But we, there are reports of patients in the, throughout the trial that have had some pretty dramatic responses. So uh, sometimes 
you know, many people think that because glioblastomas are such a heterogeneous disease, we may be missing um, some signal or some activity with this peptide. Another vaccine is called the DC vax, a dendritic cell vaccine. And as I said, as I mentioned earlier again, it revolves around those yellow cells that I showed earlier. And these dendritic cells um, basically uh, are the generals of the immune system. It allows us to, uh, allows the immune system to again learn the foreign antigens. And so um, this is a, a nice slide from Northwest Farm, Bio Farm Biotherapeutics, but basically this dendritic cell which is again in this yellow, depicted in yellow, learns um, the, I mean, you can take these dendritic cells and, and basically take a patient's tumor, grind it up, and mix them together. And in theory, the dendritic cell should be able to pick up some, some uh, proteins that are specific to the tumor. And then when you inject them back into the patients, they should be able to teach the T cells to recognize um, tumor proteins or um, tumor antigens. And in theory, those T cells should then go and uh, uh, kill the cancer cells. And right now, there's a, a large phase three study uh, ongoing in DC vax, they call it, or it's a dendritic cell vaccine. And um, this is some early interim reports, but they, they're reporting that uh, compared to controls, they're seeing some uh, improved survival in patients and they, um, there's increased activity. And so this is very early on, but um, again, very interesting results. This is a table that um, I just wanted to show that says that, you know, there are many different iterations of these vaccines that are, are being done and that um, many more after this, um, showing again that people are able to um, create very, um, are very creative in figuring out ways to uh, teach dendritic cells to recognize different antigens. And so, you know, my thoughts on the dendritic cell vaccines that it's an interesting and promising approach. We probably have seen some um, real activity. Some of these larger trials have come back negative, but it may be that um, there's only a, a small subset that are probably going to respond in each of these types of vaccine strategies, and they're not all overlapping. And um, in terms of the, the vaccines themselves, they are um, resource and time intensive. Um, you often have to get the tumor cells um, at the time of surgery, and then you have to make sure that through quality assurance that those tumor cells are, are adequate in number to be able to make um, uh, what I call a peptide soup, um, which means basically you, to grind up the tumor cells to, um, to uh, be able to mix them up with the dendritic cells. And oftentimes getting enough dendritic cells from the patients uh, can be... Um, a challenge in itself. So there are multiple steps throughout these, this vaccine that um, can uh, make patients fall out of the trial. But um, at, at the end of the day, we think that it's still a, a very interesting and promising approach. Another interesting approach that um, people have been reporting on recently is viruses, and, and they're called oncolytic viruses. And there have been many um, different viral therapies. And in fact, um, uh, viral therapy for brain tumors and many other cancers is not a novel uh, concept. Um, many people have been using viruses uh, in hopes of being the uh, definitive uh, therapy. In other words, they were hoping that by injecting these oncolytic viruses into the tumors of patients, that the viruses would be able to kill the cancer cells on their own. But I think in the past uh, few years, the paradigm has changed in the sense that um, many people believe that a viral infection can actually act as kindling to generate an immune response. And um, what, what happens is that when you give these oncolytic viruses to the tumor, these viruses do go in and infect the tumor cells and kill some of the tumor cells. And then what happens is when these tumor cells die, there's lots of uh, proteins of the cancer cells floating around. Um, they call them antigens. And then these antigen-presenting cells, remember the yellow cells that I originally uh, talked about earlier, uh, and these are now the purple cells on this slide, can then come in and pick up those proteins and then present them to the T cells to then go back into the cancer and kill them. And so 
with this paradigm, there's been some very exciting um, results. Uh, for example, uh, Tokogen was kind enough to present this data to uh, give some of these slides to me. But uh, in, in the Toka virus is basically a, a virus that attacks cancer cells. But what's very neat is on the in the uh, virus, um, they have a, um, a signal on there. If you give um, a drug um, called 5-FU, you can essentially activate any cell that, I mean, you can activate that virus to then kill the cancer cells. So what happens is that, um, you know, within the tumor, you inject the virus, and then the virus is in there, and you can give the drug, the 5-FU, which um, in theory should turn on cancer cells that are, I mean, viruses that are in the cancer cells to then kill the cancer cells. And then um, at that point, when the cancer cells are dying, you can generate an immune response. And they have presented this data um, at the AANS meeting in 2017, showing that uh, some patients had regression of their tumor. And they um, did uh, correlative studies to suggest that they actually saw a lot of immune cells coming in. So the viral therapy, again, kind of revolves around this immunotherapy um, concept. And, and there are many other um, viral therapy uh, trials that are underway. Um, that I think are going to be very interesting to follow and uh, I think have um, potential. The next category that I wanted to talk about that I think are very interesting are something called CAR T cells. And um, I, some of you may have seen this report in the New England Journal um, that was uh, published um, by the City of Hope um, group where they had a patient uh, have a dramatic response to treatment with these CAR T cells. So what are CAR T cells? They're called chimeric antigen receptor T cells. What it means is that T cells normally have a, a receptor in our body, and the receptor recognizes the specific um, abnormal protein to then do their action, to, to then dock onto that cell and kill the cell. So what people have been able to do is genetically engineer these T cells so that these T cells can um, have on its receptor, have we can genetically engineer uh, receptors that are that target specific uh, proteins, and so, for example, um, with this group, they had they had identified something called IL thirteen R alpha. Basically, it's a, a unique protein that a protein that's expressed on glioblastomas. And what they did was they basically took the T cells and put on the, uh, a receptor that recognizes the IL thirteen receptor. And then um, after they genetically made these T cells, they um, injected them back into the patients. And these T cells engrafted and then um, supposedly will kill any cell that expresses this protein. Now, what's nice about these T cells is that they don't need the antigen-presenting cell or they don't need the, the yellow cells that I talked about, the antigen-presenting cells, to, to know where to attack and do their action. And this is from their uh, paper. Um, showing that this is a patient who had leptomeningeal disease, very advanced glioblastoma. Um, they had tumor cells throughout their brain and even in their spinal, even in their spine. And after they gave this CAR T cell, um, the, the, and they gave it what they call intrathecally in the CSF, um, they saw that the tumors regressed um, uh, for, for many months. Um, unfortunately, though, in this patient, the tumor cells did come back. And so, um, there's a lot of excitement for um, the CAR T cells. And I think just because of the interest of time, uh, I'm not going to go to the difference between what they call TCR modified and, um, and um, CAR T cells. Um, I, it looks like my slides have just come off. If you give me a second, I'll try to um, uh, check something here. I'll be... Just give me a moment, please. 
Just a minute, I'm re-logging on, so I apologize for the interruption. I apologize again. So. All right. Sorry about that. Hopefully, hopefully you can see. Um, hopefully you can see the slide. Um, um, so, I think uh, on this next topic that I want to talk about is something called checkpoint molecules, and I think those are the um, immunotherapies that we've heard a lot about. Uh, these are uh, basically the checkpoint molecules are um, a, a what are a very important group of um, proteins, and they're, at, they're essentially a signaling system. So what happens is when a T cell meets uh, and finds its specific protein that it's um, this program to target, it needs a second signal to turn the T cell on or turn the T cell off. And so um, if in cancer cells, they're very good at turning the T cells off which is here on the second panel to the right. And so it turns out that um, we need this mechanism to present, prevent us from autoimmune disorders, but it also is very good at um, disrupting the immune system. Next slide, please. It turns out that there are a lot of different checkpoint molecules in our, um, in our bodies and and with these checkpoint molecules, uh, the reason why we have so many different checkpoint molecules is that the um, the uh, immune system needs to be regulated um, at many different levels so that we don't develop autoimmune disorders. Now, of the checkpoint molecules, next slide, please. Um, the two most famous ones, I think, to date are what's called anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4. And with the anti-CTLA-4, 
The first study in 2010, about eight years ago, showed for the first time in a, a prospective trial that you were able to get patients with um, uh, advanced cancers cured. Um, basically, what uh, this group did was, um, Dr. Hody did and his group did was to give patients anti-CTLA-4 uh, and these patients had metastatic melanoma and about 20% of these patients were long-term survivors. Next slide, please. Shortly after, uh, in 2012, Dr. Topalian and uh, Dr. Pardo and Dr. Snall and, and their group looked at the anti-PD-1 and they showed that when you gave anti-PD-1, again, patients with many different solid tumors, lung cancers, um, kidney cancer, and melanoma all had responses again. And what was really impressive was patients with very large tumors started to have um, responses. Their tumors actually started shrinking, uh, as you can see in the next slide here. And this is a patient with kidney cancer. If you don't mind, go to the next slide again, Christine. So where are we with checkpoint inhibitors and in gliomas or glioblastomas? Uh, next slide. So it turns out that um, there is preclinical data to suggest that these checkpoint inhibitors could work in patients, I mean, could work for glioblastomas. Dr. Fetchy showed um, that giving anti-CTLA-4 in a mouse model with glioblastoma improved survival. And Jing Zhang, when she was a postdoc in my lab, showed that you could improve survival with anti-PD-1. Others have also shown very nicely, Dr. Reardon and his group also showed that giving anti-PD-1 um, and anti-CTLA-4 could also improve survival in animals. And um, there were actually people who were given anti-PD-1 um, for GBM across the country. And uh, this was a case report that Dr. Gavin Dunn published showing that um, uh, patients' tumors were actually uh, disappearing uh, when they were treated with anti-PD-1. And that led to a phase three trial uh, looking at um, patients with the recurrent GBM uh, and give, uh, this was a, a, a phase three um, trial in which they gave anti-PD-1 to patients with recurrent GBM. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the trial uh, results were just announced last year and the survival um, was no different uh, between the control group and the PD-1 group. But they were also, there was also a very large phase three trial that's ongoing right now for patients with newly diagnosed glioblastomas and um, uh, we, are, we are awaiting the readout for that. So with the results of the, the, the recurrent trial though, there was some pessimism um, in terms of uh, these checkpoint inhibitors for glioblastoma. Next slide, please. Christine, just in case you lost, it's slide 55. I apologize, I didn't tell you the next slide. So it turns out that with um, glioblastomas, um, I mean that with, with solid tumors, there are um, some tumors that respond to immunotherapy and some tumors that are not responding to immunotherapy. And so the ones that are responding, we, we are um, calling hot tumors. Um, for example, the lung cancers, the melanomas, the kidney cancers. But there are other tumors in addition to uh, GBMs that do not seem to be responding to immunotherapies, and they're called cold tumors of the non-immunogenic, like the pancreatic and prostate cancer. Next slide, please. So what drives this dichotomy? And we, the bottom answer is we don't know yet. And it seems like there's, many of us think that there are many different factors, such as the location of the tumor, the physical microenvironment of the tumor, the genetics, and the pathways that are activated uh, in terms of um, explaining the differences between um, these cold versus hot. But from a practical standpoint, next slide, please. Um, there are many strategies um, to, um, I mean, there are strategies in place to try to make these cold tumors hot. And so some of the strategies that are being employed right now are what they call combination, combination immunotherapy. Others are trying to use radiation plus immunotherapy. And some people are trying to even use localized therapy, uh, like um, uh, local chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and I'll explain that in a minute. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, there are many different checkpoint molecules. And so um, in melanoma, for example, people have looked at combining different checkpoint inhibitors. Like the, some, uh, Dr. Walchuk uh, 
uh, for example, gave both the PD-1 and CTLA-4. And they published in um, 2015 very interesting results where when you gave the drugs in combination, people did a lot better. You also made them sicker because of the toxicities, but people did much better. And so next slide, please, which is slide 61, Christine. Um, people have been looking at other checkpoint molecules in glioblastomas. And it turns out, for example, that LAG3 um, is expressed. It's another checkpoint molecule, but for, you know, for uh, today's purposes, the point is there are more molecules than just PD-1 and CTLA-4. And so, for example, there is preclinical data to suggest that um, targeting some of these checkpoint other checkpoints could be a very effective immune response. LAG3, for example, is, a, uh, is something that we think is very exciting. And um, CD137 is another checkpoint molecule that we think is very interesting from mice models. And so from the, from the preclinical models, we for, we, for example, have trials that are open today uh, for patients um, to not just get PD-1 and CTLA-4, but other checkpoint molecules. And um, these studies are currently underway. Um, in terms of other combinations, uh, next slide, please. On slide 66, I guess, first of all, before we talk about, in order to come up with other uh, interesting combination strategies, I think one thing we need to think about as a field is our standard of care. And did we set ourselves up to fail? If you think about our standard of care for patients with glioblastoma, uh, they get temozolomide, which is very, very lymphodepleting. In other words, it, it um, wipes out the T cells in our body. And, uh, and in addition, patients get um, lots of radiation, six weeks of radiation. And um, Dr. Grossman showed very nicely that um, that can actually um, make your immune system weaker. And finally, we give our patients steroids, which also makes our patients more immunosuppressed. So perhaps we need to rethink the way we are giving these therapies. And one of the combination approaches that um, uh, we've been thinking about that we're pretty interested in is maybe um, we don't need to give uh, chemotherapy systemically in patients. And so there's this idea of giving um, chemotherapy locally plus anti-PD-1. Sorry, this is slide 67, uh, Christine. And so, for example, there's... Um, uh, we have um, devices where you can give chemotherapy locally, um, like in patients with glioblastoma, and these wafers are impregnated with um, chemotherapy. They're called gliadel wafers. And um, Demetrius Matthews is a postdoc, but now uh, um, uh, uh, who showed, who thought that perhaps giving the chemotherapy locally could uh, work synergistically with the immune system to uh, generate a, a effective immunotherapy, whereas giving the immunotherapy systemically could knock out the entire immune system. So his thought was to give chemotherapy locally with uh, immunotherapy, and, and his theory was that by giving the chemotherapy locally, you're only killing the tumor cells, and you have more um, uh, proteins of the tumors lying around for the antigen-presenting cells to come in and then teach the T cells to cut, kill the cancer. And so... Um, Slide 69, please, Christine, sorry. Um, it, we have pre, there was preclinical data suggesting that giving this combination could uh, effectively, I mean, could work synergistically in a MILES model. And again, there, slide 70, please, Christine, there are um, uh, possible clinical trials that will be starting shortly looking at this idea. In slide, uh, can you go to slide 71, Christine? Um, so the other... A thing I mentioned earlier is radiation. Currently, people are getting uh, six weeks of radiation. And uh, slide, uh, if you don't mind going to slide 72, Christine, um, you can see that um, Dr. Grossman showed that when patients are given high doses of radiation and if they become what's called lymphodepleted or um, their immune cells are wiped out, uh, the patients do poorer. And so uh, slide 73, please, Christine. Um, one, one thing that we've been thinking about is been looking at focus radiation. Uh, there's another uh, type of radiation called stereotactic radiosurgery. And perhaps if you give it um, in a focused manner where you give it only one, of, one to five days, perhaps you could get, um, you don't have to get all that um, uh, lymphodepletion, they call it, or lymphopenia. And um, 
in fact, giving radiation over a single dose to five doses could actually be inflammatory. And this is an example of a patient who got a, a single shot of radiation, and all this white around the, the tumor is actually swelling. So Jing Zhang, when she was in my lab, slide 74, please, Christine, showed um, that if you gave this in combination, she thought that this, again, could work synergistically to kill the cancer cells only and get the T cells to be activated. Um, slide 75, please. And so um, her her experiment was basically to give the mice a focused radiation and give the um, uh, anti-PD-1 to a mouse with a brain tumor, slide 76. And when she did, she showed that it worked better than either therapy alone, and we got um, survivors that were essentially cured of their tumor. So um, slide 77. Um, because of in the interest of time, I'm just going to go over these next few topics um, shortly. But, you know, in summary, there are interesting combination approaches, um, one by trying to study the tumor microenvironment better, and um, other people are looking at ways to rethink our current standard of care to not hinder an immune response and maybe even augment an immune response. Now, in slide 78, I wanted to mention briefly toxicities. As I mentioned earlier, um, in the combined CTLA-4 and PD-1 study by Dr. Walchuk in patients with melanoma, they got, a, a, they got a synergy in terms of response rates for patients' tumors, but also um, over 50% of the patients became pretty sick from the tumor. You can actually develop autoimmune um, conditions like colitis and pancreatitis and, and pneumonitis, uh, which is all like inflammation in the colon or the uh, pancreas or the or the lung, and so um, what's interesting also is in slide 79, please, Christine. Um, these symptoms come after certain doses of drugs. In slide 80, please, Christine. And so these these side effects are not benign, and in fact, people can get very sick. They can get, um, for example, with the colitis, you can get a lot of diarrhea and even bloody diarrhea, and, and people can even um, uh, need to be hospitalized for these conditions. So um, with these side effects, it's, it's, it, it's also um, uh, really stresses the point that we have to try to identify the patients who can respond to these therapies um, so that the patients who won't respond to these therapies can be saved from these side effects. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, it's slide 81, please. Um, if only about 20 to 30 percent of the patients are responding, and we don't know that data for glioblastomas yet or gliomas. Um, it is in our interest to try to um, develop biomarkers so that we can predict who will respond. And some of the first biomarkers in slide 82, please, um, show that um, when you have um, the target for the PD-1 receptor called PD-L1 um, expressed on the tumor cells, that, that is predictive of response. And Dr. Taub and Dr. Topalian showed very nicely that if you express the, um, the, the ligand or the, the partner for the PD-1 uh, on the tumor cells, you were likely to respond, um, whereas if you didn't, you were not likely to respond. And slide 83, please. And in GBMs, we do know that this pd one is expressed. So that's why there's still hope that the PD-1 could still work for glioblastomas. Slide 84, please, Christine. In addition, another uh, biomarker that's um, very interesting is something called the, the genetics. It turns out that if you have lots of mutations, uh, your tumors have lots of mutations, there's lots of good protein, new proteins or weird-looking proteins that um, the immune system could figure out it's coming from the cancer cells and could generate an effective, effective immune response. And they found that, if, for example, in patients with lung cancer and colon cancer, that if you have more mutations, you are more likely to respond to immunotherapy. And um, as a result, um, there has now been an FDA approval for patients whose tumors have high mutations, and that is one of the indications to get uh, immunotherapy. Slide 85, Christine. So circling back to GBM, while there's been some exciting um, findings in other patients, and we still think that the data, um, we still need to wait for the data for the PD-1 data for patients with glioblastoma, but there are other therapies that are um, seem to be working. 
Um, what we've learned about glioblastomas at the end is that the GBMs are really not like other tumors. Um, and the reason why they're not like other tumors is that, as I mentioned before, there's those uh, in that early panel, there's what's called the antigen presenting cells, which are the, the yellow cells and then the T cells. And when you look at patients' tumors, patients with GBMs, um, the tumor samples under the microscope, there are very few T cells. And in fact, there are a lot more of those yellow cells. They're, they're called myeloid cells. And in fact, those myeloid cells have been programmed to be actually turned off. And so many of us believe, slide 86, that these myeloid cells are the keys to trying to um, uh, uh, initiate an immune response or get the immune response started. And it turns out that these myeloid cells are very important in um, probably not only suppressing the immune system uh, locally, but also um, systemically. And so um, it turns out that these myeloid cells, next slide please, slide 87, um, actually can uh, inhibit an immune response um, not only in the brain, but throughout the entire body. In fact, patients are, are thought to be more immunosuppressed if you have glioblastomas. And so many of us believe these myeloid cells need to be targeted. And uh, there's preclinical data, can you go to slide 88, that suggests if you target these myeloid cells, you can, again, get improved survival in these animals. And these myeloid cells have many different ways to be targeted. And so in slide 89, um, there are other, other types of uh, um, agonists that are being actively investigated. And there are a lot, which I think is very encouraging and very exciting. So slide 90, please. So in conclusion, you know, I think that, um, you know, immunotherapy is gaining um, FDA approval across multiple solid tumors. And a readout from uh, large GBM trials are still pending for uh, things such as checkpoint inhibitors. And there are now combination approaches that are underway that uh, I think are very exciting. Uh, there are other immunotherapies that are out there that have also had some exciting results in the um, chimeric T cells, not only just from City of Hope, but uh, Dr. O'Rourke, for example, at, at uh, UPenn, at University of Pennsylvania, has some very interesting uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cell trials, too, that are, are, are going. But um, I think that it's not just these checkpoint molecules, but other immunotherapy approaches that are promising. Um, Dendritic cell vaccines are also uh, another very interesting approach, as well as the viruses. And there are um, other creative things that are um, on the horizon, too. I've seen things such as um, artificial antigen-presenting cells. In addition, I think for glioblastomas, we really need to understand the, uh, our current standard of care um, to make sure that we're not handicapping the immune system uh, to give um, our body the best chance to fight off the cancer. And finally, I think that we need to uh, appreciate the toxicities um, with these immunotherapies and understand that they're not benign. Next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to also acknowledge um, that some of this is work from our laboratory and, and want to make sure that uh, the, the folks in my laboratory um, uh, get credit for this because um, I, I feel very privileged to work with uh, um, many bright individuals. And I also want to acknowledge our clinical trials team in slide 92. Um, in slide 93, I just want to acknowledge the funding that we've received. And um, I apologize, slide 94, if you could skip that. Um, it's, it's the same um, conclusion, but this was the original conclusion slide. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, you can go to the disclaimer uh, slide. And um, we'll take any questions. Christine, I apologize, but you may have to um, either uh, text me the picture or I'll try to log in again, but I'm not able to um, see, the, see the window. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Um, and I apologize to everyone for the technical difficulties that we experienced during this webinar. We will be sending everyone the recording for this webinar in an email tomorrow to cover any parts that were missed. Um, we'll also be um, answering many of the questions that were asked in this email tomorrow um, in the interest of time. So thank you all for joining us, and thanks once again to Dr. Lim for his wonderful webinar presentation. Besides our free educational webinars, ABTA has a variety of programs available to help connect patients and caregivers with information and resources to help support them in their brain tumor journey 
as well as publications and resources for healthcare professionals. For more information, visit ABTA's website at www.abta.org or call the ABTA Care Line at 1-800-886-2282. We will now conclude our webinar.